I hope and trust. I find you all, my dear friends, and welcome to the ninth installment of Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And for this particular session, we're looking at a title that reads as follows. Beware of covetousness. Beware of covetousness. A story is told of uh, one young gentleman who goes for an interview. And in that panel, someone asks, it must have been the CEO, inquires, where do you see yourself in the next five years? And this is what the young man says. I see myself seated where you are seated. Was that ambition? Was it arrogance? Was it covetousness? So as we're looking at the issue of covetousness, the issue is, are we able to draw the line to say beyond this point, it ceases to be ambition and it has a ring of covetousness. Before we go into our study, why don't we pray together? Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, dear Lord, we are about to consider issues of the mind where it all begins. How we pray, dear Lord, that you may speak to our hearts and inform our minds. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask tabernacle with us. Amen. For our lesson study, there's a topic of verse that we're looking at. These are the words of Jesus Christ. At Luke 12, verse 15, quote unquote, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You know, you need to be aware that there is a pitfall of covetousness. And when it strikes, it strikes pretty hard. And Christ is being very um, transparent with his um, managers. And the managers are you and I. Because there is a former manager, a former employee, who has had this problem before. So Christ discloses to say, you know, in the discharging of your functions, you may find that there are these pitfalls that um, can come your way. And some have fallen in this particular space. And how have they fallen? Um, we're going to be looking at the situation that befell Lucifer before he became Satan and the devil. But before we go there, Christ wants us to appreciate how this thing can be downscaled to our level. Lucifer in the book of Isaiah has a problem of um, sitting on the throne of the righteous one. We're going to get to that. But as far as you and I are concerned, what are our concerns? Our concerns are at Exodus 20, the verse is 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his men servant, nor his maid servant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's at number seven. So as we look at these things that can be converted, there is something that Christ makes clear in the word. And what does the word say unto us? You shall not convert your neighbor's house. Take not, it is your neighbor's. Number two, it is next door to you. Number three, it is not yours. Number four, you do not live in it. Number five, you did not buy it. Number six, you did not build it. Number seven, you do not own it. So when we come to issues of converting, this is you taking things that are next door while you're in your house with your mind. So this is what you do appreciate. It's all happening in the mind and you're saying, I wish that was mine. I wish that was mine. I want that, which is not yours and it is not in your reach and you should not be having it. For you to have it, you have to dispossess another. For you to have it, you have to get rid of another. And he goes on, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. So coveting thy neighbor's wife, we even have an example in the Bible. The story of David and Orea. You know, David is on the rooftop and he's able to see across into his neighbor's house. And who was his neighbor? One of his army commanders, Uriah, the Hittite. So he sees his wife uh, taking a bath. That's not where we are for now. But the Bible says you shall not be picking your neighbor's wife even with your mind. Do not covet it. Do not even think about it. Don't entertain the thought. Do not entertain the thought. And it doesn't only end there. Even the husbands, not just wives, even the husbands. It doesn't mean that uh, coveting is something that is uh, sexist and the preserve of men. Even women can covet other people's husbands. The next one, you get the point. 
his man servant, his maid servant. Don't be going there and say, uh, listen, when, when, when your employer is not around, can you do a peace job for me on my yard and I'll pay you? That's covetousness. That's covetousness. You are looking at how the neighbor's yard is well manicured and then the next thing you are entertaining uh, thoughts of um, cutting down on expenses. You don't need to transport anyone. don't need to feed anyone. You just pick your neighbors. Or how much is your, is your employer paying you? Then the next thing you have spoken to the maid and she is now working next door. How does that um, foster your relations thereafter as neighbors? How, how, how? You know, the, the, the maid is here today and then the next thing, the, the maid is next door. It, it just doesn't work. Nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So it, it's an open-ended, it's, it's a text holder of some sort. So th there is no way you can say it, it, it's a closed text. It, it, if it is not um, the wife, the husband, the ox, the maid, the manservant, then I'm done. You know, obviously the car is not listed there. The phone is not listed there. The laptop is not listed there. You, you know, there is an unlimited list. But what is the principle? It does not belong to you. It belongs to another. Do not wish to take it and get rid of the person who has it. That is covetousness. That is covetousness. Simply put, simply put. Now, let us look at Lucifer and how this befell him. In Isaiah 14, from verses 12 up to verse 14, it provides as follows, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You know, as you're looking at this story, um, it, it sounds like a good story of ambition. It, it's a story of ambition. There is nothing wrong about you saying, you know, I also want to become the CEO of the organization. I also want to become a director of the organization. I also want to be a company owner. You know, the, the, the problem is, besides ownership, we have a situation whereby... Uh, most of us, we lack ambition. We're just content to be where we are at. The, the, this is the problem. And, and, and the Bible does not necessarily say, do not be ambitious. We need to appreciate that there is an underlying context to this whole issue. When Lucifer is seeking to be like the Most High, you know, now we're going to step into the issues of the Trinity, the issues of uh, the triune God. Now, you, you're going to appreciate, this is just for understanding, that Michael is the archangel, the commander of the angels. That is one of his titles. So when you get to the book of Daniel, when he says Michael shall stand, that is Christ in his commandeering, combative mode. So Christ is the commander, the, the chief in command of the angels in heaven. So that's why when he appears, he appears in the glory of the father and the glory of the angels because he's an angel. So Here's the other thing that um, maybe is difficult for us to comprehend. Christ is equally God. He's God. So he and the Father are one. He and the Father are the same. He and the Holy Spirit are one. None is derived of the other. None is produced by the other. They are there from eternity to eternity. The rest that we don't understand, do not worry. Work towards getting to heaven Figure it out when you get there and ask the questions when you get there. So what um, the devil has a problem with by the time he is Lucifer here, the, the, the problem is the devil seeks to surpass the station of Christ as the commander. And he wants to set his throne, a throne of his own at the level of the father over and above that of the son. God the son, God the Holy Spirit. God, the commander of the angels, he wants to set his throne above his throne. This is no longer an ambition. This is a coup d'etat. He wants to usurp. There is no room for a fourth throne here. There is the, because when you get to the book of Hebrews, the father says unto the son, sit at my right hand. 
So the devil is saying, I, I don't want to sit at the right hand. I want to have my own throne, which is equal to that of the father. I, I, I get the whole point. This is where it says to be ambition. It, it becomes malicious. It becomes um, harmful. So when you seek to dethrone, I, I, even in modern um, uh, constituencies, when you dethrone um, a sitting candidate who has been elected by the masses, that's a coup. It's a coup. So whether you call it a boardroom coup, a political coup, anyone who has been appointed, when you remove them from office so that you can assume that, that, that space, that is a coup. It, it is not ambition. That is covetousness. In the business space, in the political space, it is covetousness. And in the spiritual sense, when you then look at the issue of the devil, that's how it becomes covetousness. So how then does this play out? Here's what happens. Because he sought to take the place of the commander, then war broke out in heaven. There was a war in heaven because the, 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 the wing that was being affected was the military wing of heaven. The, the, the wing that was being slighted was the military wing of heaven. And so heaven has to go into a defensive mode and they defend the boundaries, the territory, and the sovereignty of heaven. And as a result, we find the devil being kicked out. And he is thrown out onto earth. That's another issue when you get to heaven. Ask God, God, why earth of all places? One inspired writer says, you know, he tried other places and could not find a place where he could be received until he landed here on earth. And our forebears, they received him and they entertained this guest to their peril. The issue is, even though the devil's case ends with him kicked out of heaven, how then shall it end with those who seek to harbor feelings of being covetous in matters of faith? It ends with us being disqualified from heaven because we're at the same level with liars, extortioners, witchcrafts, sinners. It is seen, even though it is conjured in the mind, perpetrated in the mind, and it might not even leads to a physical user patient. Even if you just end it at the mind, beware of it because it disqualifies you. It disqualifies you. There are some people who had a challenge with covetousness. Joshua 7, you can find the story of Achan. Uh, they have been told you're not going to take anything from Jericho. When God has uh, tumbled the walls of Jericho after seven days, Achan sees this Arabic rug that he loves so much. He picks it, takes it home, and that was the end of his family. Why? Because he coveted it. He wanted to keep it for himself. And in that process, surely God is bringing down a whole city. What is a rug to God? What is a rug to God? You know, some of these issues of covetousness are so tiny, minuscule. They look like God will not miss this. He will not need this. You know, he already has too much of it. The issue of covetousness is not what you are taking away. It's from whom you are taking away. So it doesn't matter whether the person has more of it, does not need it. The issue is in the story of Achan, it is not yours to take. It is not yours to desire. It is not yours to pick. That, that's the issue with covetousness. It's not what is taken. It's the principle behind it. The principle behind it, God had much more. He had no reason to go after the rug. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. And you're also going to find the story of Judas and um, Mary. Mary has come in and uh, she has um, washed the feet of Jesus. And Judas turns around and says, you know, do we really need to have wasted a lot of uh, this expensive nard? We could have sold it and given it to the poor. Now, there, 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 there are three players in this um, uh, scenario. Player number one is Jesus Christ who is receiving this attention from Mary. Judas, who was a thief, <laughs> picking from the treasury. He, he is thinking, you know, I, I could make some out of this. And, and what drives him is this attention that has been given to Jesus Christ vis-a-vis -vis the, the denarius that uh, I, I, can, I, I, I can pocket out of this. That kind of covetousness is one that says, why you? Why you? And, and the other thing, we could have uh, taken this and given it to the poor. Whose perfume is it? Mary's. Whose decision is it on what to do with the perfume? It is Mary's. 
some of the covetousness that we find, especially in the business space, it's a covetousness that has to do with how people use what is theirs. You hate someone just because they take time to drive their car? It's their car. They fuel it. They are the ones who decide where to go and where not to go. And what is your issue with it? Covetousness comes from those things which don't even belong to you. How other people decide to deal with what belongs to them. And then as a result, there are these hard feelings. There are these hard feelings. And, and, and lastly, the other scenario you need to be aware of when it comes to covetousness. You know, in the book of Acts chapter 5, you can find the story of Ananias and Sapphira. This is the New Testament church where people have come in and they are giving whatever they can for the growth of the church and even as they are moved by the Holy Spirit. So this family also decides to dispose of their property and give it to the cause of the Lord. And having done so, what do they do? They go out, get the money, and when they come back, they decide to pocket part of it and remit part of that money. And in so doing, Peter, um, talking to the husband, the husband um, claims to have brought all the money and he is struck dead. The wife comes over, given an opportunity to set the record straight, sticks to the story that they conjured when they were at home, and she's also struck dead. Now, when you're looking at that story, you, you may find uh, disciples that are a bit hard. You know, these people are already planning to give something. Do you actually strike them dead? What became of their property? Did the church even take it thereafter? Well, the Bible is silent on that. But the issue is, some of the covetousness that comes up, it comes up in spaces of worship. It's good to do the good things that other people are doing. But when you do it so that you can also fit and be part of that select few that have sold property, the motive, the motive is to be seen. The motive is to be high there and, you know, be perceived as one of the benefactors of the church. And when we operate with that kind of a mindset, this is how it turns out. Because this is driven by covetousness, we are going to find ourselves at the risk of losing not only our positions, but life itself. We'll lose life itself when we go into these competitions in spaces of worship. In spaces of worship, not in the home, just like, um, I mean, uh, Jesus, um, Martha, I mean, Mary and, uh, and Judas, that was in the home setup. We could be looking at a political space at war in the context of Achan. But now when we're looking at in the spaces of worship, people are doing the right thing, but with the spirit of covetousness, donating with covetousness and lying with covetousness, claiming things that aren't so because of covetousness. And lastly, you know, so what? What is the solution? What is the antidote? This cannot be complete until we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The verse is stated. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God does not leave us to be tempted in the context of covetousness, even though it is the last, the last commandment that we're given. Commandment number 10. God goes on to say, commandment number 10, read, read with 1 Corinthians 10, 18. You are not going to be left alone. If you cannot withstand covetousness, I'll give you a way of escape. My dear friends, may the Lord bless us as we become a way of covetousness. Fight it to the nail, and make sure that we are prepared for the kingdom to come. What are the takeaways? What are the takeaways? If it does not belong to you, and it is in someone's hand, and you have not purchased it, and you have no title to it, and it would mean doing away with the honor for it to become yours. If you are seeking it, if you are going after it, it is not ambition, it is covetousness. And there are seven examples that are given. And any other thing, and any other thing which is thy neighbor's. Take note, it's about relations with the neighbor. You will always need the neighbor, so the neighbor must be in a house. You will always need a family nearby, the neighbor must have his family. 
You always need a neighbor who has a good loan and uh, livestock to be taken care of. The neighbor must have his manservant. The neighbor must be fed and clean. That's why we need a maid servant. The neighbor must have a means of survival. That is his ox and any other thing. Even a donkey. Don't even wish it was yours. That is where the avenue of sin begins. That's where the street begins. You go down that street, there is no end to what you're going to do. Murder is another option. Go and check what became of David and Uriah. Look at what Ahab and Naboth had. That's an issue of covetousness. I like your garden so that I can have my garlic in there. That's an issue of covetousness. So the Bible has a lot of these, but I wish that we can just apply them in our lives and say, Dear Lord, may you help me to overcome this temptation. If it has come too strong and too heavy for me, give me a way of escape. Until we meet again, may the Lord prosper you and bless you. Amen and amen. Thank you.